SCP-7234. G is for Greece. The SCP Foundation has been involved in a lot of weird scenarios. For an experienced field agent, there isn't a whole lot that will phase them, or that they won't believe possible. When a team of explorers gets sent into an uncharted anomalous space, absolutely anything can be expected, and then some. It's not a pleasant job, by any means, but it's often a necessary one. SCP-7234 is another extra-dimensional area that the Foundation deems to need some exploring, but sometimes it might be better if they just sealed it off and ignored it from the get-go. Let's take a look. SCP-7234 is the entrance to an extra-dimensional space located in a cave system underneath Site-91. This space acts as the source of a non-Newtonian viscous orange fluid, similar to deep-frying grease, which exerts contradictory properties in regards to its viscosity. While it's able to run with the approximate viscosity of water, it captures organisms and objects like a more viscous substance. During lab testing, the fluid has indicated a pH level of 1, and has been able to partially dissolve rock. It's also flammable, and is able to evaporate into a gaseous form, which is colored dark yellow and appears to make up most of the cloud cover within the extra-dimensional space. The fluid travels through the entrance into main reality, pooling up into the cave system underneath Site-91 and the rate of this flow has noticeably increased in the time since the Foundation has become aware of it. The current containment procedures involve a collection system that the fluid flows into, which is then disposed of through standard anomalous fluid handling procedures. The anomaly was discovered by Foundation Department of Systemic Transformation staff in 2002, after a CK-class reality restructuring event prompted an investigation of all Foundation sites. During the process, a team noted that one of the Site-91 stairwells extended 90 meters below any other stairwell, and was not present on any Site-91 blueprint. The personnel discovered that the stairwell intersected with a cave system, which led them to encountering the fluid and the entrance to the anomalous space. The anomaly responsible for the reality restructuring event has not yet admitted to having any knowledge of 7234 so either it erased its own memory of it during the event, or 7234 existed prior to the event. Between June and August of 2002, the Interdimensional Anomaly Exploration Group conducted many incursions into the anomaly, starting with a series of autonomous, robotic vehicles. Most of these attempts failed, however, as both the liquid and its gaseous form interfered with the circuitry of the drones, preventing them from accurately exploring the anomaly. Even when the drones were reinforced, they could not withstand the high temperatures and frequent seismic activity. So of course, if reinforced drones can't handle it, it's best to send in a four-man team. The exploration party consisted of one senior agent, Gene Kessup, two agents, Matt Martins and Ed Muller, and a technician, Trevor Johnson. They were all equipped with several stationary radios and UDP transmitters, which would be planted through the space in order to facilitate communication with base command. Due to the hazardous environment, the team was equipped with heat suppression suits and hazardous chemical filtration apparatus, along with standard gear for a long-term incursion, including two weeks worth of food and water, as well as a basic shelter. The primary goal was to determine the source of the fluid, and the extent of any pre-existing life within the area. They start by testing their transmitter by taking a photo of the cave system, showing the fluid running along the ground into a graded floor. Ed says that he can't get his air filtration system to work, not remembering to hit a switch on his chest plate, and Gene says that if he wants to be replaced on this mission, he can, but he does not. After passing through the entrance into the extra-dimensional space, while still being inside of a cave system, Ed mentions how hot it is in here, despite the heat resistance of the suits. They brought some photos of the cave systems around Site-91, as they wanted to compare the differences, and so far they've seen the exact same stalagmite formations in here. 
At this point, Matt realizes that Jean and Trevor are from the Department of Systemic Transformation, not the Interdimensional Anomaly Exploration Group, which Matt and Ed are from. Jean says that the agent in charge wanted members with expertise in systemic transformation on the mission, but they all have the same goals. Ed remarks that it feels like they're in something's stomach, like they're going down an esophagus and being digested. Gene says that he may have a point, as the cave system so far has been devoid of large chambers, just winding passageways. The formation of the cave system here makes sense when considering the acidic grease running through them, but they're identical to the caves on the Foundation's end, which don't have the grease. The team sets up camp and eventually continues on, later reaching the exit to the cave system at the surface level. The view outside is similar to the valley that Site-91 was built inside, but parts of the mountains have been corroded by grease, and Site-91 doesn't exist here. Matt notes that the sky is completely overcast, and he can see the grease evaporating up there. Gene says that the grease is coming down from above the clouds, but it isn't raining, it's more like the mountains are oozing with it. There's also a bunch of watchtowers, or what looks like some, and there's some sort of complex in the middle of the valley with a tower that extends up past the clouds. Ed coughs and complains that the heat is even worse up here, and it feels like he's getting cooked alive. He claims that his air recycler must not be working, as it feels like he's breathing hot, greasy syrup. Gene agrees that the air is sticky, like a thick, viscous liquid, but Matt tells Ed to stop complaining. Gene looks at the compound in the distance through binoculars, and notes that it's covered in a diamond symbol that she doesn't recognize. By the time Matt wants to take a look though, the binoculars have already fogged up. Ed asks why this area is like this, and where's the grease coming from, and if it is a stomach, then what's eating them? Trevor guesses that it's something up above the clouds from the look of things, and maybe they can go up that tower. Ed, however, says that maybe they should turn back, as they have more questions than answers, and should let the researchers figure it out. Gene says that the complex can't be more than a few days' walk away, and they should go to it while they're here, as she has the authority to clear them all for urban exploration. The team starts walking then, eventually setting up camp when the sky becomes a darker color. They find a spot underneath a plateau overlooking the valley, and Ed comments that the view is kind of beautiful, with the starlight dazzling off of the grease. He then says that he's miserable, as it's like a sauna here, but instead of steam, it's evaporated grease. Gene reports for the log that they inspected one of the watchtowers, and they're still not sure why they're there. They haven't found any plants or animals yet, even dead ones. Matt suggests that maybe there were animals at one point, before everything disappeared, but Ed says that they haven't even seen a skeleton yet, and it's unsettling him. Matt says that maybe they got digested, or maybe they just all flew to the moon, as it wouldn't be the first time. Gene interrupts to say that it isn't helpful to speculate about things like that, and transmits a picture of the watchtower, showing it to be embedded into the side of a canyon. The stem is made of a chrome material, while the top is square and made of a brown steel material. Each side has a window, one of which is broken, and a stream of grease drizzles across the top of the tower and down the side to the ground. She says that they couldn't find anything of note in the watchtower, despite them being all over the canyon. Ed wonders if maybe they could sleep in one to provide cover from the elements, and Trevor reminds Jean to mention the earthquake. They experienced a little bit of seismic activity today, enough to trip them up, and they think that that's what disrupted the drones. The following day, they begin rappelling down the canyon, when another minor earthquake causes a mishap, and Ed rolls his ankle. He can still walk, but he complains about the pain, and how being covered head to toe in grease doesn't help. Matt says that he didn't join this task force to babysit and when Jean threatens him with a court-martial when they get back, he says that she doesn't have any authority over him, as they're from different departments. She replies that 
on this mission, she does. So Matt backs down and says that they should at least make it to the complex. Ed chimes in with another theory, that this isn't a stomach, but it's trying to become one. There used to be people here, or aliens, because of the watchtowers, but they're not human design. Trevor agrees and says that they look like Sarian architecture, an alien species mentioned in B is for Bloodborne. Matt mishears and says that he's never been to Syria, but he doesn't think it looks like this, and Trevor decides not to correct him. Ed continues and says that what this environment is supposed to do is break them down into a liquid form, but it can't do that yet, so it's trying to disarm them with earthquakes, and they need to get out before it can do that. Gene and Matt both agree that that's a stretch, and they don't have enough evidence to draw a conclusion. Trevor suggests that maybe it was some kind of weapon of mass destruction, as the watchtowers and bunker clearly point to it being some kind of military base. Matt, however, jokes that someone dropped a bomb on it and it got covered in grease, like they contracted out Ronald McDonald to build the Manhattan Project. Gene just says that they should get to the complex and see what they can find, while Ed asks Matt what his theory is about all of this. Matt just thinks that the Foundation did it, this universe's version of the Foundation, and maybe they were testing some kind of anomaly and it went wrong. Gene asks if he really has that little faith in them, but Trevor agrees that everything here could have been built by an alternate Foundation. The team eventually reaches the compound, which is built in a similar manner to the Watchtowers, with the first and third levels built from the same chrome material, and the second level built from the brown material. There are several diamond-shaped windows built into the walls, and a tower extends from the top of the complex, past the cloud cover. The inside of the first room is relatively empty, with a dysfunctional lighting system installed into the horizontal edges of the room. An emblem consisting of four triangles embedded into a pentagon is engraved into the room's floor, with grease beginning to pool into the logo center. Ed notes that this complex is carved right into the cliff, and would be a bad idea with all of the earthquakes, so maybe they built it before the quake started. They map out the first floor of the complex, and there doesn't seem to be anything here, like someone took everything that wasn't nailed down. They proceed to the second floor, where they find a computer station. Six tall metal machines dominate the center of the room, and a large screen is embedded into the west wall. Rubber wiring is scattered across the room's floor. In the southeast corner of the room, a device is built into the wall, consisting of two cylindrical crystalline discs attached by a pillar made of black metal material. Trevor notes that the technology of these computers looks like it came from 50 years in the past and 50 years in the future at the same time. Jean notices a display in one of the computers, and what she thinks to be a power button. They take a vote on whether or not to push it, with Trevor wanting to wait for the cavalry to come in, but Matt and Ed both of the opinion that there's no reason not to push it. The button is pushed, and the computers whir to life before suddenly stopping. Some text then pops up on a screen in English, reading, Starlight power drained. Please reconnect. They are suddenly hit by a massive earthquake, with the sound of metal bending and floor collapsing heard over the quake, and Matt screams. The sound of metal bending and floor collapsing comes from downstairs, so they proceed down with their guns out, heading into the basement. The floor has ruptured open down here, and there's a channel filling with running grease. Trevor remarks that he's never seen grease run that fast and Jean says that they need to get back to base when another earthquake occurs. Parts of the floor fall away, making the sound of tearing metal, and Trevor becomes separated from the others by the channel of grease. Ed tells Trevor to jump, which he attempts, but he tumbles into the grease river and screams. He submerges helplessly, and his screams become muffled before being carried away by the grease. Ed tries to go after him to save him, but Gene orders him to get out of there. Before he can respond, however, the ceiling collapses above the team, and Ed screams in pain. The sound of further seismic activity is captured by the team's microphones before the transmission is cut off. 
Personnel at Site 91 investigated the entrance to the area and found that a severe cave-in had occurred, damaging many of the transmitters used for communication. Analysis of the cave via sonar found that the cave-in effectively eliminated any route between the surface and Site 91, and that substantial tunneling efforts would be required to re-establish a route. In an attempt to re-establish contact with the team, however, they erected an experimental high-frequency antenna within the entrance to the space. Contact was re-established after 15 hours without communication. Jean says that she's never been so glad to hear another person's voice, and reports that Trevor is dead after falling into an underground river of Greece. Matt says that he doesn't want to think about it, as his face was haunting. Ed exclaims that his skin is peeling off as his suit flushes itself and he screams in pain, with Jean reporting that Ed's suit was compromised and some grease slipped in. They're making their way back to the cave entrance, as even with the cave in, it's their best chance of making it out alive. Ed moans that the grease was boiling hot and his body must be covered in burns before beginning to sob. He says that Trevor jumped and he was supposed to grab him, but he slipped right out of his hand. He could have grabbed him if his ankle hadn't been rolled, and he would be alive now. He had a family. He wasn't supposed to die like this. Matt tells him to stop, and Gene says that he can't blame himself, but Matt says that as far as he's concerned, they're all dead, and he's not spending any more time listening to Ed whine. Gene says that they're going to the cave entrance, end of story, and they both need to pull themselves together and act like Foundation agents. Later, when they're around halfway back, Jean reports that they're going to rest in the forest here as they're low on water and they shouldn't exert themselves. A popping noise is then heard on the audio, and Ed says that the grease gave him acne the size of golf balls, so he can't help but pop them. After a pause, Gene says that it looks like the grease streams off in the distance are going faster, but Matt just says that it's an optical illusion. After another pause, Gene says that they received Dr. Donner's message about the acid drill that they're using to dig through the cave-in, which should only take them a week. Another earthquake occurs, but a minor one, and Gene reports that Trevor had the water recycler, so they can't get any more water. If they ration it and avoid exerting themselves, they should be able to last at least a couple of weeks. Eventually they reach the cave entrance, and Jean says that it's high ground here, so they shouldn't have to worry about the grease. Another popping sound is heard, as Ed mentions how good it feels, and Matt tells him to stop it as it's creeping him out. Ed retorts that with these burns, his skin tears open every time he moves, so popping the pimples is the only release he has. Matt asks why they don't hear the drill running by now, and Gene says that they ran into some difficulties, but they're on their way. Ed says that the reason he's here is because his brother is the agent who first found the anomaly, and used his pull to get Ed here. Gene says that she's sorry and they'll be out of here soon. They sit at the sealed entrance for a while, as Ed continues to pop his pimples, and Gene asks the drilling team to respond with progress updates, as the temperature has increased noticeably. Matt's getting more and more upset, and says that if interdimensional were running things, they would have rigged up a teleporter or something and they'd already be out, eating welcome back cake. Ed begins to cry and says that he's a monster, prompting Matt to say that they should have left him in the basement where he belongs. Unfortunately, at this point the acid drill was decommissioned, as the grease began to interfere with the tunneler's mechanisms. Explosives could not be used to clear the blockage without risking substantial damage to Site-91. 0513 then gave an address during a meeting of the IEG working group in which he emphasizes that the Council's stance is to rescue personnel at all costs. The Foundation's personnel are their most valuable resource, as recruitment and training are costs that must be paid, and they can't afford paying these costs repeatedly. 
It's O513's understanding that the IEG is engaged in an incursion into the anomaly known as 7234 and that despite knowing that the space was hostile to even their finest robotic drones, the IEG elected to send in a team of humans. Now this team is trapped within the anomaly due to a lack of foresight, and their attempts at retrieving them have unilaterally failed. They have personally disciplined those responsible for these decisions, and the agent and doctor in charge will never set foot anywhere near the IEG again. The mission into SCP-7234 is officially a failure, as they did not acquire any of the information they desired, and they lost four innocent lives in the process. They're not ordering that the rescue mission be halted, as that would leave a rather nasty black mark on the records of everyone here, but it's considered more of a very strong recommendation. The 7234 project is consuming a surprising amount of resources right now and there are plenty of other projects that need those resources and are guaranteed to yield better results. He tells them to move those resources around immediately, and is aware that this means dismantling equipment that is currently being used to communicate with the surviving members of the incursion team. Since they can't support them now, in any way, shape, or form, the most ethical course of action is to stop providing the illusion of support. They're on their own now. The transmitter used to communicate with the team was dismantled, but a few more communications were recorded beforehand, and a few errant radio communications were received by Site 91's standard antenna for some time after. Jean is still asking for updates, but Matt tells her to listen to the utter silence coming from the cave, and says that they should go back to the complex. It's the only place here with anything in it, and there's gotta be something useful in there. Jean, however, says that it's far too dangerous, and is convinced that the Foundation is coming. Ed then screams out in pain, saying that he can't take it anymore, and takes off his suit. He says that a hole burnt into it when the grease got in, and now it's rubbing against his skin and burning him alive. Matt remarks that he looks like a lobster, and Ed says that he's been cooked alive. His skin's been torn in two, and he's covered head to toe in zits, which he continues to angrily pop. Sometime later, Gene continues to request updates on the drill status, reporting that two of their heat suits are compromised, and they need immediate medical attention. Matt, however, says that he's going back to the complex, telling Gene that she's unfit to lead. He says that at Interdimensional, they taught him to innovate and to actually do something. When he starts to move, Jean pulls her gun out and orders him to stay. Matt tells her to shoot him, and after a pause, says that she doesn't have it in her. He tells her that the Foundation is full of bureaucrats who don't care about people, and don't care about anything but their own little projects. Jean tries again to order him to stay, but Matt walks off and disconnects his communication system, as Ed continues to pop his zits. Later, while still popping zits, Ed says that they're going to die here, and he can feel his body evaporating. It smells like a corpse here. He can't think, and his tongue started to shrivel up. Gene tells him to shut his mouth and pull himself together, as she's scared too, but she's trying not to think about it. She says that she's not worried though, as the Foundation is coming to save them. Ed isn't convinced despite Jean's conviction, but they're interrupted by the sudden appearance of a thick layer of grease rapidly descending from the mountains towards their position. The logs become intermittent, but the two proceed to grab the rope and rappel down the side of the canyon, despite Ed's objections. Down in the canyon though, the grease begins to flood the valley, and Jean says that their only chance is to climb the tower. They seem to spot Matt in the distance at some point, and move to make contact with him, but the transmissions keep getting cut off. They join back up with Matt, and Ed remarks that he was kind of right about this place being a weapon and a stomach. A whirring sound is heard, and Matt says that he's going to end this once and for all. It seems that Matt discovered a teleporter of some sort, and Gene tells him that if he uses it, the grease flow will only get worse. 
Matt replies that he doesn't care about this rotting husk of a world and activates it. The sound of electricity is heard, followed by the sound of Matt screaming before being abruptly cut off. Ed asks if he's dead, but Jean says that she doesn't know. Later, Jean says that the grease is up to the second floor of the bunker now, and Ed is trying to get a lock open, but he continues to pop his zits in the process. Later still, it seems that the grease caught up with them, and Jean tells Ed that he has to move or he's dead. Ed, however, says that he's already dead, and he can't make it up the tower like this, so he tells Jean to shoot him. He doesn't want to drown in the grease like Trevor did, and Jean hesitantly pulls out her firearm, says that she's sorry, and fires. She then begins to cry, before eventually moving on and climbing the tower. She tells herself that she needs to make it up, and that it can't all be for nothing. She's climbing a metal ladder up a steel cylinder, as streams of grease flow from the top of the cylinder. She continues to cry as she climbs, but eventually makes it to the top, entering into a very large room. She stops to sob, and kneels down, asking something if it caused all of this. She then sends one last image, of a blue sky with cumulus clouds in the distance. A giant, balding, obese man, over 300 meters tall, is seen eating a hamburger. Massive drops of grease fly out of the burger and dribble down his mouth and shirt, pooling on the mountaintops and streaming down to below the cloud cover. Jean begins sobbing uncontrollably, asking why, before the log ends. No further communications were received from within 7234, and over the next week, the grease output reached up to five times its normal level before returning to only two times the previous baseline. Further incursions into the space are forbidden. Well, SCP isn't known as weird fiction for no reason. Rather than some sort of eldritch deity inexplicable to all human understanding, however, we have a giant man eating a hamburger. There's no great explanation here or resolution, just an unfortunate extra-dimensional space that some unfortunate individuals were sent into. The theory that the situation on the other side was due to an alternate foundation is probably a pretty solid one, or some other alternate group of interest that inadvertently made a giant man with giant burgers. Chances are though that we'll never know, and that's perhaps for the best. Maybe there's some sort of grand analogy here involving consumerism and modernity destroying our world. Or maybe it's just a horror story about a big man and big burgers. <laughs>